And good morning, everybody. We're live. Congratulations. You, you made it through the week. Another week of fantastic food safety, food quality, amazing products. And if nobody else says it out there, guys, Jose and I are going to say this right now. Good job. Yep. You did a good job this week, and we really appreciate all that you do. Because unfortunately, a lot of times in food safety and quality assurance, Everything that we do goes unseen, but we see it, and we're very grateful for what you do. So if you're new, pull up a chair. My name is Brian Armentrout, and I'm with the Food Leadership Group. And every time at this week, every week at this time, there we go, uh, we do the food safety chat, and we live stream on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, and we have a conversation around something around food safety. And what you'll notice here is this is not a presentation. Uh, this is a discussion. And last week, we had an amazing one, and I know that's going to continue on this week because we have a fantastic guest here on the show, Mr. Jose Sabal with Sabal Fleet Safety Consulting. How are you today, sir? I'm very good. No complaints so far. <laughs> there you go. So one of the things that we love to do here in the chat is let us know where in the world you're at. So I'm in a balmy Loveland, Colorado, where we've been getting weather in the mid-60s. Uh, this is the time of year, Jose, where you get lulled into a false sense of security where you have very nice weather and you're outside in the yard and then you get a foot of snow the, the next day. But, uh, it, it's an interesting thing is, is March and April are when we get most of our snow. And hopefully the leaves on the trees haven't come out because you can get a lot of damage, obviously, because you get this really wet, heavy snow and it yeah. just, it just ruins everything. But um, are, are you in Florida? Where are you at today? Oh yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm home. And, and the weather over here right now, it's, uh, let me quickly tell you, 77, clear skies. The sun wow. is out. <laughs> it's very hot for, for 10 in the morning. Well, I mean, this is Florida, Brian. So mm. it is what it is. It is what it is. And so people are starting to come in here. John, good morning. Of course, Tim, always great to see Tim. Rainy in Nashville for Tim. Well, hopefully you're inside here today. So one of the things that we do here on the chat when we get started here as well is everybody, Cara, good morning. Please join us for a drink of your favorite beverage, coffee and tea for us. Cheers, everyone. Yeah, mine has a lot of uh, uh, lemon because I'm coming out of uh, some kind of a weird uh, uh, sick. I was, uh -huh. It was kind of a flu, but only for today's Friday, so only for four days. I'm feeling good already, but I was feeling really bad yesterday in the afternoon. Huh. So just kind of low energy or? I was feeling congested, Brian. Mm. Yes. And, and kind of a little bit of a headache and, and you know, a, a runny nose and that kind of stuff. And, and yesterday was the worst day. And today I'm, I'm feeling extremely good. Mm -hmm. It was weird. I cannot tell oh. you something different. You're just there and gone. Yeah, I mean, you sound great now. So yeah. hopefully you're. Hopefully it's all done. So today's topic, let's, I got a ton to go over here today. So last week, the FSPCA, the Food Safety Prevention Control Alliance, which is kind of this hybrid uh, academia, industry, government-funded FDA group, uh, issued a very important document, and they gave a webinar. And so uh, my friend Kathy Gombas was involved with that. And they went over the update on a very important document for hazard analysis. So FDA has been very helpful in this. So this is version two. Version one came out, gosh, over four years ago, longer than that. Um, kind of listing hazards associated with your programs. And we'll get into the guts of all of that. But um, one of the things that we do here on the chat is, and, and Jose has done a great job of teaching me this and making sure that it's <laughs> drilled in my head, is you always have to define your terms and what it is that you're talking about because we assume that people are experts, right? So Cara and Tim and John, you know, people who are on here know what they're talking about, but there's other people who listen to this who don't, right? So we want to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. So obviously the first thing, Jose, is what the heck is a hazard analysis? Okay, right. <laughs> and, and, and you know, and, and this is amazing. Because your question seems to be, I mean, in our world, seems to be the most simple question ever. Yeah. And it is not, because there is no full understanding of this. Actually, to make a side note to my comment right now, Brian, 
I was reading LinkedIn yesterday, and Margaret Balfour, she's a mm-hmm. friend of mine, and uh, uh, she posted the main or the top nonconformities in BRC. Mm-hmm. And there were five major nonconformities. Three of them were GMPs. Mm-hmm. So if you develop a system and having effective GMPs in place before setting up your program for hazards and those GMPs are not working, well, how can you expect that HACCP is going to work Right. if the GMPs are not working? So to the point, HACCP, Brian, is a risk assessment technique officially. And anyone that goes into ISO 31010 is going to find that there mm-hmm. is a risk assessment technique. So when everybody or when I or when anybody says, oh, I have a HACCP system. No, you do not. You have a system based on the risk assessment technique that is called HACCP. Uh, that's what we have. Very, very good distinction, right? It, it's it, it's something that you think is simple, but it's not. You have to kind of think about it a little bit. It's about, and, and this is something that I'm fine tuning now by taking these masters that I'm right. going through right now, understanding risk and understanding that the structure of a system, you need to understand depending on the unit of analysis, in this mm-hmm. case, is the food safety program, you need to determine how to determine risk. That's uh-huh. your responsibility. Now, in <clears throat> the thing is that everybody is talking about food safety, and it's not just food safety, because if you read the, the laws and the regulation everywhere, the problem is adulteration, not mm-hmm. just safety. The fact that food safety is the biggest problem, yes, it is. But even if the product is not in compliance with its own quality characteristics, the product is adulterated. If you're going to sell a bread that is 12 inches long and the bread is 11, the product is adulterated, even if it is not representing a concern, a uh, potential co- potential issue for uh, causing illness or injury, but the yeah. product is adulterated. Yep. It always comes back to those two things, right? So adulteration and misbranding. Those are the yes. two things that FDA always comes back to. And it, it's yep. good to set that framework. So there, there's two important terms under hazard analysis as you go down into that next level is reasonably foreseeable, right? And that's... That's a that's a phrase that's got a lot of context behind it, doesn't it? You know what, Brian? When I read the first time the new definition of what we used to know as a potential hazard, mm-hmm. okay, the known or reasonably foreseeable, that's a new name. Right. I said, why this is, you know, why there is this name, why the name was changed. Because if you look at the definition of a potential hazard, it includes the reasonably foreseeable. And even if you go to the National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Criteria for Food in 1997 and all the information there, it includes that already. Mm -hmm. The thing is that in the past is kind of a people forgot a little bit that that section is part of the definition of potential. And they were using only those that are known without looking for the others. So in my opinion, I believe that the FDA did a very good thing in reminding people that it's not just about the known. It's also about the reasonably foreseeable. And the reasonably foreseeable most likely are going to depend on intended use, storage and distribution uh, conditions, uh, consumers, and that kind of stuff. Right. It, yeah, it's exactly what, what Cortland is saying here, right? FDA is changing its definition of risk. And I think part of what they're saying here as well is y- you just can't sit back and, and you need to you need to take responsibility and see what's going on out there in the industry. So uh, if there's a rash of uh, 
high heavy metals in cinnamon associated with a toddler applesauce, right? You just can't go, eh, right? And it, you need to keep up on these things because FDA will come in and say, are you aggressively addressing this risk associated with heavy metals in your product? Well, no, nah, yeah. FDA will say, that's reasonably foreseeable. You should be paying attention and in increasing your programs relative to this risk. And that's why shows like this and, and my local site where I keep updated on the, you need to, and what FDA I think is saying here is the subtext, you're responsible for your program and you need to make it current. You need to see what's going on in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And the, 100%. Yep. And the, the other piece of this is severity. And I think this is something in uh, hazard analysis systems that people kind of skip over, right? So it's like, What's the likelihood and what's the severity? And people kind of go, eh, and they, they put their finger in the air and they kind of guess. Um, but you need to put a little bit more effort into it than that. So, for example, you need to look at things that may be relatively low risk, but have a large impact. And so, as we know in the past, when you know the, the government was doing their Carver shock analysis and these type of things after the terrorist attacks, that you need to look at distribution and volume as well. So pasteurized milk in and of itself is relatively low risk, but because it's everywhere, you need to be thinking of it in those terms. Um, so you need to be looking at those impact type items as well. Um, they've also called out in here, and I saw this quite a bit in the document, and we'll, we'll go into this as well here on the chat, is you need to consult with outside expertise. Yeah. And FDA has mentioned that several times in this document, and they did it. You know what, Brian? T talking about that, Look at this, you and me. What we do on a typical day? Well, I will be teaching a class or I will be um, uh, helping someone in uh, mm -hmm. identifying a gap analysis. I could be traveling to teach a class or I could be consulting, helping yeah. people developing programs, understanding certain topics, and that's it. But the fact <clears throat> is that we have a lot of time where we are just finding information and reading these guidance documents in details. I really don't think that anyone that is day-to-day -day as a quality control person in a company, oh my goodness, that, that kind of people, they're very busy with their day-to-day -day activities. They don't have time to spend four, five, six, eight hours, 10 hours reading because they need to do other stuff. So right. it makes sense to find a consultant. Yeah, and this is our job, keeping up on this stuff. And yeah. what I what I ended up doing in industry when I was working in quality assurance for companies, I would end up doing this on the weekends, right? And and that gets yeah. pretty tiresome after a while. Um, there's a comment here following up on my, my applesauce thing. Um, let in cinnamon in the applesauce. Uh, let's not talk about, was it intentional or not? Yeah. Good question. I haven't seen anything updated on that. But what was interesting on this, Jose, and I talked about this a little bit last week, is, is, is Frank Giannis got involved in this on Twitter because the companies that were involved with this saying, oh, this, this is a supplier issue. You know, uh, the suppliers had a problem. And Frank Giannis very rightly said, no, this you cannot delegate that responsibility. You are responsible for your supplier programs. You need to be checking for these risks. You're responsible for what comes in your door. 100% right. Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. Whomever was the company importing that product, Brian, that mm -hmm. company was supposed to have an FSBP program. That company was responsible to make sure that the company in Ecuador has a effectively implemented food safety plan for the product that they were making. And yeah. because they were purchasing ingredients and they were subject to the preventive control for human food, the company in the United States is responsible to check that the hazards that they have in their own hazard analysis are the right ones. Yeah. So don't blame the supplier. The real, you know, the real responsibility, the FSBP says, the FSBP course says that now since FSBP, the responsibility is shared between the importers and the and the foreign uh, manufacturers. Yeah. It is their responsibility to receive only ingredients that are not adulterated or misbranded. 
Right. Exactly. I mean, like Cortland says here too, senior management yeah. must step, must accept one hundred percent of the risk. Yes. Why so the risk. The company needs to control the risk. The FSVP, the importer of record, needs to val- evaluate the risk. The supplier needs to have those programs. You need to have those checks. But yes. the buck stops at the manufacturer. Yeah. Yep. Because they understand the context. And in Appendix 1, FDA calls this out several times relative to infant formula. You need to take this into consideration for your products and the special risks associated with those elements. Um, personally responsible. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, so. Oh, yes. We, we, personally. We, and, and we've definitely and, seen that, right? With, with and, like Bluebell. And just to fine tune uh, Cortland's uh, uh, comments, whomever is the senior person, that person is personally responsible. Yes, yes. you're right, 100%. Yep. As, de- as determined under the Park Doctrine. And if you don't know what the Park Doctrine is, you need to watch this chat. <laughs> 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 so we're, g- we're going to get into the document here. And on, on my locals group, I will put a copy of this on there if you don't have it. Uh, FSPCA has, has promised that when they get the web- webinar re- ready, they're going to upload the webinar that we attended last week. So we will be posting that as well in the locals group so that you guys have access to that. Um, if you're not a member of the locals group, I will put that link in at the end. It's free. And uh, it's a good place to kind of pick up stuff that I talk about. So within the document, number one, and FDA emphasizes several times, is so, Jose, if, in, if an FDA investigator comes into the plant, can they audit you to this guidance? Okay, so the guidance document is not auditable, okay? But it's available to the public. Yeah. So if you are producing, and I'm going to use a simple example, uh, you are producing some bread and you're using flour, but the expectation is that your hazard analysis of the flour, of the ingredients, do have aflatoxins. That, not aflatoxins. Uh, uh, I'm going to say Myco- mycotoxins. Huh? Oh, yeah, myco- mycotoxins. Mycotoxins. As a general pro, I don't recall. I believe it's, it's not aflatoxin. It's something else. But it's a mycotoxin, to my point. So the yeah. expectation is that the hazard analysis of the ingredients is going to have that. Now, going back to the source, which is what I'm explaining always, trying to make people think about this. Mycotoxins. Can they be, uh, hold on, are they hazards? Yes, they are. They will cause illness or injury. Okay, so they need to be controlled. Where? Well, whatever is the control most applicable. So where these mycotoxins are forming? At the farm level. Mm-hmm. That's where the mycotoxins form. Okay, so if you grab some uh, wheat and you send it to a mill, and the wheat contains mycotoxin, the farm is responsible for that. Mm -hmm. Because the food law applies to every single link in the food chain. Right. The farms cannot send that, why? Because the product is adulterated with something that cannot be removed further down the line. Right. The facilities receiving that wheat to make the flour should not be receiving that because the same way that is prohibited for the farms to ship the products is prohibited for the mills to receive that product with the with the mycotoxins. Yep, exactly the same as for our earlier example, uh, cinnamon with high levels yeah. of lead. There you go. Same thing. Yep. So let's uh, let's dive into the standard here. So one of the areas that that caught your attention, and they mentioned this several times in here, is training, right? So training a lot around training here, right? You read that section that uh, the FDA has spelling all the different trainings for all the people in the guidance document. When I read that, you'll say, oh, okay, finally, thanks God he's out there. Because I'm not sure if you read the last one. The last one says training to the senior management to understand what food safety means. Training of, what was the other one, uh, Brian? Training of the uh, purchasing people. Yes. To make sure that they understand the hazards of the pros coming in so they make the right decisions, you know, when they are, you know, uh, purchasing 
about what is high risk and what is not high risk. And depending on that, which are the documents that they need to have for their supply chain uh, program. Yeah. So, yeah, plant management, adequate training, supervisory personnel. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, One of the things that I talk about all the time is everything that we do doesn't matter unless you have trained personnel. And the key linkage in that plant, and going back to your comments earlier around GMPs, is the supervisor. The supervisor is the person on the floor. The supervisor is the person who has a team of people that they're responsible for. She's the person who's responsible for making sure that the rules are being followed. Your job is not to be out there being a policeman. No, it's their job to enforce the rules. And this is where those failures occur, right? So if if the employees on the floor see the supervisor run past the hand wash station, guess what? Are they going to wash their hands? No. Right? They need to lead by example and they need to make sure that their teams are doing what's responsible, right? Because they are responsible for the food production. So when FDA is visiting your plant and auditing you, that's one of the first things they're doing when they're on the floor, right? They're watching that, right? They're, they're, they're sitting there watching the hand wash station. And that's the yep. supervisor's responsibility to make sure his teams are doing this. And, and you know now that, that you mentioned that, I mean, look at this. Everybody's supposed to be trained on hand washing. Yes. <clears throat> now, the supervisors are the ones responsible to supervise, to check that people are doing whatever responsibilities were assigned to them. Whatever, yeah. and we we'll use the same language in the, uh, in the regulation, whatever duties were assigned to them. Now, if you look now at the culture and this supervisor is going, let's say that that you are the supervisor and I'm the one not properly washing my hands and you say, Jose, you know why you are not washing your hands uh, properly? And you are kind of, uh, you know, being enforcing this issue. I don't like that. I don't like you you know, uh, raising your voice at me in front of other people, all that kind of stuff. So now the culture plays a role. Yeah. How these things are going to be uh, done, how the supervisor, which are the ones responsible to make sure that everybody is following the GMPs, how they are going to approach that enforcement, because that should be in a way that is not damaging the relationship, the the people relation, the behaviors of people. Right. It's a very complicated issue. It is, and I like where FDA went with this with this new version. And one of the biggest changes, and this was all based upon this is why we're emphasizing this section so much, is they removed an entire section from the, the hazard analysis piece. So in the last version, they had the microbiological risks, the chemical risks, and the physical risks. And the physical risk, people were kind of confused by some of those. But guess what now? Gone. The physical piece is gone. And what FDA has said in this document, as you read through this, is physical risks are very much determined at the manufacturing location. You need to be addressing these as part of your training, your GMPs, and your controls within your facility. FDA says it's your responsibility. Now, if things come in with foreign material in those, that falls under your supplier program, right? So if you have metal shavings coming in in your flour, right, it's adulterated, and you shouldn't you receive, it. receive it. Yeah, that's your training, training programs. So within this section, yeah, which is on page 25 under training topics, and just to kind of summarize this, because there's all kinds of good things in here. Jose found seven different topics here. Plant management training, supervisory, People responsible for food production, right? That's the majority, right? 80% of the people in the plant. Responsibilities for cleaning and sanitizing. And that's something FDA has been looking at very closely as well. Uh, Maintenance. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. And and we've talked about this on the show before. If I'm going out and I'm auditing a plant or approving a new supplier, one of the first places I go to when I'm on the floor is the maintenance shop. Yeah, me too. That's a good it's a good indicator, right? If you have a clean maintenance shop with no metal shavings on the floor, equipment is put away, the the toolkits for the guys are are clean, and there's no wood tools and all that other crap that we see, that's a good indicator that, that that's a good plan. Oil on the floor? Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, that's always a good one. Um, let's see, next one's in here. Personnel for responsibilities for purchasing, as, as you mentioned as well, right? This gets overlooked so much. Um, is that an applesauce company with that cinema supplier looking at that now? Uh-huh. Yeah, they are. Don't, don't learn that the hard way. And the last one here, human resource personnel should have training adequate to enable them to ensure that all personnel receive training necessary. That's a big call out and it's important. So what they're saying here is if you work in human resources and you're responsible for helping to oversee the training programs in that facility, you need to understand what's required. You need training. Can you train someone on, and I'm going to say hassle, but I may say GMPs. Can you train someone on hand washing if you have no clue and you have never seen the written procedure for hand washing? No, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. So how human resources is going to train people? They cannot do it. They are not qualified for the job unless, unless they take the class and they go through everything, you know, that quality control go through and then, okay. But otherwise, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like OSHA in your production facility, right? Yep. The personnel responsible for OSHA, the safety department or HR, whoever it is in the facility, needs to be trained and versed in those requirements. And FDA is saying the same thing here. Good. Very yep. good. Exactly um, right. So what was very interesting in here as well is, is FDA and CIFSAN, right? I mean, not CIFSAN. Well, they were involved with this. I'm jumping yeah. with my acronyms. So FSPCA, right? So CIFSAN is the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. That's FDA's scientists. Um, they, they say in here that this was developed with CIFSAN and industry experts. And they specifically call this out in several different places. They don't name who they are, but I thought that was very interesting that they did that. <laughs> you know um, what, Brian? But, what I yeah. believe that is the most valuable um outcome of having this appendix number one in the guidance is the ability to find hazards that are typically associated with the production of certain products. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and uh, the reason for this is that if you go to ISO 31010 and you look under HACCP, HACCP is a risk assessment technique in that uh, document, there is a section that shows up the limitations of each and every single risk assessment techniques, the, the pros and the cons, let's put it like that. When you go to the limitations of HACCP, the limitation number one says that in HACCP, the fact that the hazards are not easily identified is an issue. Well, what this guidance is doing, providing people with the hazard that are difficult to identify when you are implementing the HACCP program. Mm -hmm. So it's a great approach. Yeah. Nope, I agree. And it gives them a new perspective because that's one of the things that we were talking about before here, right, is you, you need to get outside of your bubble. And I think that's what FDA did on this as well, too, which was good. Um, so one of the things that we talked about here earlier, right, there's only micro and chemical, no physical tables now. And we'll go, in, we'll, we'll go through the tables here a little bit and kind of show some stuff here that kind of surprised us. Uh, they're specifically calling out in here as well, Jose, is, okay, this does not apply to industries that already have existing regulations in place, so low-acid canned foods, right? You, you can use these documents maybe as, a, a, as an addendum, but they're saying LACF is already in place, and that stays where it is. And th this kind of gets back to uh, what Cortland is saying here relative to the source on this for devices, right, medical devices. And I agree with that observation because it's my assertion that long-term, over time, what's going to happen is these different standards, food, medical device, uh, see all these different seafood, they're all going to merge, right? And they're all going to follow the model of pharmaceutical medical device. That's the direction we're headed. We'll and, and you know what? To, to Cortland's point, mm -hmm. the, the place within Title 21 of the uh, regulations where you can find a very good explanation about systems is in medical devices, section 820. Mm -hmm. And if you read that section, I hope that this section should be applicable to everywhere, not just medical devices. People will understand what is a system and how to implement systems. Yeah. 
Because they're all systems. So LACF. So they're saying out. Another one that gets a lot of attention in here, and there's a lot of commentary around this in here, is infant formula. So, so what they're saying in this document is, if you are manufacturing infant formula, you have very, very specific risks that you need to be addressing in your systems that are not necessarily called out directly in this document. Coronabacter. Right? Yeah. You need to be addressing these risks accordingly within your system. And so what FDA is saying here, I think in these, these documents, it goes back to this known and reasonably foreseeable standard that they're using. You need to be taking at the risk, right? If you're, if you're producing products for infants, you need to really, really be buttoned up. And, and uh, Brian, again, okay, the guidance is not applicable to low acid canned food. And I'm going to say, okay, I mean, you, you might say that. Now, in the guidance, do you have Clostridium botulinum? Yes, of course, in the guidance. Okay, mm -hmm. so which are the ways that we control that? Well, one of those ways is sterilizing the food, like low acid canned food is doing. Yeah. The fact that low acid canned food is kind of a, okay, you guys are exempted, to me, seems a lot like the, what is the name that they use for this uh, extreme lethality? <laughs> well, what oh, is yeah, the, the, new term, the new term, yes. I want to get it right. Where it's exceptionally lethal process. There you go. There you go. So is the sterilization an exceptionally lethal process? Yes, it is. So fine. You know, if you want to take it out, fine. But to my point, that exceptionally lethal process is still the control for the hazard. The fact that the control is extreme does not going to take out the fact that that's exactly what is being used to control that hazard, which is significant, by the way. It's a hazard yeah. that requires a preventive control. Yep. And so, yeah, let's, yeah, so the exceptionally lethal process, and that was something that they brought up on the webinar pretty quickly, and people noticed it right away, and they went, what? what? What's an exceptionally lethal process? So Kathy talked about that a little bit on the webinar. So some of the examples they give is, like, if you're making caramel. So you're, you're taking sugar and these type of things and, and you're boiling the holy hell out of them to make caramel. Nothing's going to survive that no. is what they're saying. Now, let's say, but you, I mean, okay, fine. You're going to be okay from a micro standpoint, but you could still have pesticides or heavy metals or other things that don't care about that. Or right? Physical so hazards. right. So it's not a get out of jail free, free card. It's just saying that under specific circumstances, exceptionally lethal processes are going to really minimize your risk. Yeah, that's exactly uh, right. So, so other other examples they gave jams, uh, acidified fruit cocktail, which I thought was an interesting example. Um, yeah, and, and baked goods, so crackers and things like this, right? You're you're preparing this this paste, this dough, right, and then you're baking the snot out of it, and chances of anything surviving that very small. But what's interesting is yeah, Brian, so sorry to interrupt you, but I would like to make a quote to your comments here because you're talking now about certain products that after the process, they are going to be low in water activity or very low in pH and that kind of stuff. As long as the company has evidence of the validation of that pH or water activity throughout the shelf life of the product, Yes, it's going to be an extremely lethal process or whatever you want to call that. Right. But and, yeah, and, and to show the evidence. Yeah. And just because you have an exceptionally lethal process doesn't mean you get to go, oh, okay, I'm fine. Right. You, you still need to have a food safety plan and you still need to yeah. document why your process is exceptionally lethal. Yes. Ah. So uh, a comment here. So uh, Jacqueline, clean label project and consumer reports have made real progress on the baby food adulteration issue. Yeah, absolutely. So consumer reports, right? They do this every now and they'll just go to stores and pull product off the shelves and do testing, right? And yeah. so you have these consumer groups out there that do these type of things. Um, so big changes. Let, let's take a look here in the document, right? So within this document, and again, I'm going to make this document available on locals because you'll notice in here that I have gone through and highlighted some stuff that caught my attention, right? So the biological, chemical, and physical hazards. The revised Appendix 1 no longer includes a table for reasonably foreseeable hazards for process-related physical hazards. 
because those are unique to each facility based on their operations and processes. So, so in uh, 2000, and I believe the, the previous draft was 2016. Don't, don't quote me 100% on this. Uh, no, that's, right. that's correct. Yeah. Yes. So in that one, you have three tables for each of the different categories of food. Tables one were for uh, focus on biological hazards, as mm -hmm. same as right now. Tables two were focused on chemical hazard, same as right now. And in mm -hmm. the past, we have table three for process-related hazards. Okay? If you look at that, in my, you know, if I try to think about this in some way, they were trying to, I'm going to say mimic what was done in the seafood hazard. Yeah. In the seafood hazard, we have in chapter number three, of the fish and fishery products hazards and controls guidance, we have uh, tables for species related hazards, biological, chemical, or physical, it doesn't matter. And then, no, biological or chemical, and then you have process related hazards. And that's where you may have the biological cross contamination, not keeping the right temperature, allergens, and metal and glass, and so on. Yeah. And that was a table that was removed. And now everything was transferred to the different chapter, mostly chapter two and three, where they explain that depending on the specifics of each and every single facility and the equipment, people is responsible to analyze potential inclusion of anything that is part of the process. Yeah. Good observation. So, so this, I, this caught my eye here too, Jose. Uh, get your comments relative to this. So, keep in mind with this this standard. They're they're saying here, hey guys, this is based upon what we knew in 2022, right? So, over you know year year and a half ago when they created this. But what I found very interesting here on this page was a section that I've highlighted. Is they're also showing us potential hazards that they're thinking about. So, number one, you'll notice in here is when we get to the uh, the chemicals, right? Allergens. Does not include sesame, right? So obviously the rules have been updated here in the U.S. to include sesame. It's not here. Don't forget about that. But what I found interesting was the section I've highlighted. So they're saying we didn't address specific specialty ingredients. So this shows me what what FSPCA and SIFSAN and the government are thinking about is there's some new stuff going on out there that we need to keep an eye on, right? Reasonably foreseeable. You need to keep an eye on these risks. Uh, seaweed extracts, such as carrageenan, right? That's getting a lot of attention in the beverage industry. Um, protein extracts from plants. Look at this. Uh, protein extracted from peas, right? So we're getting all of these type of alternate drinks now. So almond milk and all these different type of things. Um, think about all of the um, meat analogs and other different products that are being manufactured out there now. Uh, egg white proteins, right? So they're, they're pulling out some other specific examples here. What they're saying is there's going to be unique risks associated with those that you may need to consider. So, for example, on a lot of these plant-based things, um, my prediction on this, bless you, is emerging pathogens. So Bacillus cereus has always been something that's kind of hanging out there, right? A lot of times it's associated with, we hear these stories of the the Sunday picnic for the church group that leaves potato salad out on the on the table in the hot sun all day long and everybody gets food poisoning from bacillus cereus, right? So bacillus cereus produces toxins. Those toxins hang around. They even have emetic, heat-stable toxins in those. So if you're producing plant-based products, and I think this is why FDA called this out here with this little bit of information, is you need to be thinking about these emerging risks with these alternate uses for these ingredients that we haven't done in the past. Yep. Like... Uh, Brian, for example, what about histamine in some hard cheeses? Really? Yes. I didn't know that. Amazing. Histamine. Amazing. Histamine. The fish histamine. Yes. From where? Well, I have no clue, but I read that recently. That should be what? a hazard. That it should be a concern for people manufacturing cheese. That some type of cheese is a hard cheese with a very specific characteristics. But yes, histamine is something that may happen. Wow, I, I didn't know that. Yes, that's why, I love, that's, why, that's why I love having people like you on the chat. I learn something every time. So thank you. Um, 
And so Cortland here is making our point here as well, right? Is people were too yeah. focused on limiting themselves to the tables. No, the tables. And this is exactly, thank you, Cortland, for setting me up. Is yes. They're saying here, this is the starting point. These are the things that you need to consider. They may apply to you. May, they may not comply to you. There's other things like Jose just mentioned that you may need to think about that aren't here. Yep. And, and you may fit those one, uh, Brian, with a reasonably foreseeable because the fact that we have this appendix number one does not mean that those tables are going to have all the hazards. Mm -hmm. It is still the responsibility of the PCQI to find which are the hazards applicable to all of the ingredients and all of the processes at the facility. Yep. And, and I like what they did in here too, relative to the hazards. And they called this out in the slides with the presentation is that if you're producing like a bakery item and you have flour and you have eggs and you have chocolate chips or things like this in your cookies, you need to use these tables for those ingredients and go look at what are the hazards for chocolate? What are the hazards for the flour? And add those things up. So in, in the past, right, it was like, okay, chocolate chip cookie, here's the risk, blah, 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 blah. Here's those things, right? And it wasn't allow you, allowing you to easily then segregate those out and say, okay, it's, it's actually those subcomponents that are the risk, right? Now, your facility, of course, GMPs and all the things that we're talking about here, but you need to be looking at those as well. Yeah. And, and the fact, Brian, that certain hazards may happen at different stages in the process, different steps in the process, that's another thing. Because the yeah. fact that you say, oh, if I'm purchasing, let me uh, think about, let's say that we are purchasing black pepper, grounded, ready to eat black pepper. Look at this example. <clears throat> the product is ready to eat. So that means that at the time of receiving, that product cannot have salmonella. Mm -hmm. If I go back to my supplier, because now my supplier is controlling that hazard, my supplier yeah. is the one that is responsible for that control and they receive the black pepper from the farms, well, black pepper from the farms are going to have salmonella. That's fine. It's a raw product. You know, it's in the ground and whatever. <clears throat> so they are supposed to be processing that, heating up somehow that, but after the heating process, the product is ready to eat, exposed to the environment before packaging. Mm -hmm. So that means that between after the heat process and before and not well at the packaging material at the uh, packaging stage whatever amount of steps are there the product is exposed to those conditions is exposed to salmonella so people yeah. cannot say oh i control salmonella because my product was heated well that is salmonella that is coming with the ingredient but you need to tell me how you're going to be controlling the salmonella that is present in your environment because your product is ready to eat, exposed to the environment before packaging. And that's right. a different salmonella. Yeah, and, and so you need to understand that and have two different conversations. So when you're yeah. talking with your pepper supplier, it's like, okay, there's a known risk in this ready-to-eat pepper salmonella. Are you controlling the hazard? Yes or no? No, yep. no, we're not. Okay, I need to control the hazard. How am I going to control that in that pepper? Eventually, let's say that you're going to use that black pepper. That is, hey, hey, hold on. Let, let, let me fine tune this, uh, Brian. <clears throat> if the supplier says that the black pepper is ready to eat, it is their responsibility to control the yeah. salmonella that is coming with the raw ingredient and the environmental salmonella. We are, the, I'm the receiving facility. I'm supposed as a PCQI in my hazard analysis to put in the hazard analysis of the grounded uh, black pepper, two salmonellas. One, the one that is coming from the field and the second one, the environmental. Uh -huh. You cannot say, oh, uh, the product may have salmonella. Well, for, from where? Who's the one responsible for, for that? Because your supplier is responsible for the control of both of those sources mm -hmm. if the product is ready to eat. Now, if the supplier says, oh, uh, Brian, be careful. This product is not ready to eat. This is raw, grounded, but raw uh, black pepper is when you can say, okay, at that point, something that is not being used a lot yet is FDA in the um, in the regulation and also is part of the class 
You may write a letter to your uh, uh, client saying, watch out because my black pepper has salmonella, okay? Yeah. And the these companies are supposed to receive a written assurance, which is what mm -hmm. a document saying, Jose, don't worry, because I'm going to be using this as an ingredient for a product that is going to be cooked by me. Right. As long as that interchange of information is available, we're not going to have any trouble. At some point before consumption, the hazard of the salmonella is going to be controlled. Right. Yeah. Another good example of that is in the dairy industry. So I, I worked with a company that was producing uh, milk, you know, so just like retail fluid milk, and they were spinning off the cream and then selling the cream to an ice cream company before pasteurization. Right. So oh, we had go. to notify the purchasers and we would put this on all the documents and everything that not notice this is raw cream. It has not been processed to control hazards. Yep. You have to let them know. So yep. with that, let, let's take a look here a little bit more in the document. So, so what was interesting on here too is, is there, and what I highlighted here is their treatment of Shigella, right? So they, they've kind of changed around how they're dealing with Shigella because it had a separate column in the micro table. It doesn't have that anymore. There's the LACF, right? Infant formula, right? They're talking here in A156 a lot about infant formula and how you need to be looking at your risk. And what I like about this too, Jose, is really they're talking about everything because if yeah. you have a special hazards associated with your product, all right, let's say that you've got a generic product and you're making something, but you're targeting and you're marketing your product to infants or toddlers. Follow this information. So here's the particulars, right? So they, they've changed this around a little bit. So you notice here on the most relevant, right? It just says most relevant, right? It's saying here's, here's the top potential threats you need to be looking at. It's not all of them, right? There's other potential threats you need to be looking at. Uh, you notice here that they combined parasites and viruses into an overall category, right? They're not calling out cryptosporidium or other specific parasites. It's now a category. Yep. So, and here they talk a little bit. I'm not going to read through this. Uh, notes about viruses, parasites, and Shigella. Go through this paragraph and understand what FDA is saying relative to this. Um, and, except and in you know what? Parts, yeah. Talking about that paragraph, because I read that one and I said, well, yes and no. The, if you read the paragraph, the basic approach, the, the basic outcome, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that, oh, we are controlling this with GNPs. And mm -hmm. I'm going to say, hold on, because every time that in the market you buy, oh my goodness, strawberries, and someone got sick with hepatitis A from mm -hmm. the strawberries, that means that hepatitis A is a hazard that requires a preventive control. It's a significant hazard. Why? Because it's in the market. And now yeah. we have the evidence. Yeah. So, so at that point, if you go back to the intent that is written in the law, do you remember uh, the last uh, our last chat? that we uh, uh, disclose, we show the people that uh, definition in the law of the preventive controls. Uh, yeah. You have the definition of the CCPs, and then you have the definition of the preventive controls. And one of the definition of the preventive control says, and in any other place within the scope of the GNPs where the hazard is identified as a significant hazard. Yeah. So, and definitely, I think what FDA is saying here, right, as we kind of summarize the, this section here, because it, it can be confusing, is, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, you need to look at this in terms of your particular elements in your plant relative to 117 and 112, like they're talking about in here. So, don't think that, I, I think my caution on this is don't read through this information and then just yank Shigella out of your, your hazard analysis because FDA has changed how they're looking at it. I would not do that. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's a section of lethal, lethal process that we talked about. Mm. Um, and so what I want to get to here is, let's see, notes about consumer cooking. Oh, this was very interesting, Jose. I want to get your comments on this. Notes about biological hazards in food products that consumers cook. In some cases, the outcome of your hazard analysis for food, such as uncooked fruit pies, 
could be known or reasonably foreseeable biological happens that will be controlled by the consumer cooking rather than by preventive control. Wow. That contradicts, okay. right? Go ahead. Okay. So look at this, Brian. Do you remember these huge recalls that we had in flour? Mm -hmm. Flour is a raw product. Flour is going to have E. coli and salmonella and who knows what else, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, why the recall? If the products are raw, why the recall? Why the FDA is recalling product with E. coli, flour with E. coli? Oh, most likely, I might be wrong, but most likely is that the E. coli that is there is not in the amount that is typically found in the raw product. Mm -hmm. It's because there was cross-contamination at the facility and the amount now is larger. Why? Because the facility was working under insanitary conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you apply that approach to this, if you send a fruit pie to the home and you have the minimum possible a uh, 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 potential biological hazard there according to the ingredients and the process and everything, that's fine. The, the customers that are following the instructions on how to cook, the pie is going to be fully cooked and, and perfectly well for consumption. But if you send that pie and during the processing operations, you are not cleaning sufficiently and effectively, whatever, and that pie has a very high level of contamination, it doesn't matter that the consumer is going to be following the instructions on how to cook. They may not be fully cooked the product in order to prevent uh, having someone uh, sick. Yeah. It's, it, I, I'm very surprised that they put this in here because we've had past issues. So um, pot yeah. pies, ConAgra yeah. had a big, big thing with pot pies and they made, they made this argument and said that we're relying on the consumer to properly prepare and cook the pot pie, nobody eats frozen pot pies or raw pot pies. They're always cooked, same as a fruit pie here. Um, and the court said, no, you cannot rely on the consumer. Uh, there was a case with cookie dough, right? Uh, Nestle, oh, yeah. where, where Nestle said, hey, listen, you know, cookies need to be cooked. And if people are eating the raw cookie dough, that's an inappropriate use and they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, the court said, no, you know darn well that people eat raw cookie dough. You need to take that hazard into consideration. Yeah. So be very, I mean, if you are working in a company where this section could potentially apply to you, be very, very careful. Very careful. Yes. Yeah. Don't, don't view that as a get out of jail free card. Um, <laughs> so radiological hazards, the way I look at radiological hazards, Congress put it in the, in the law that you need to address this. FDA put it in the regulations. But in here, right, they're saying that the chances of this happening, very small, right? So known and reasonably foreseeable, but they have to address it. And they're saying there are some instances where radiation could potentially get into, into the product. So you need to think about it. So FDA is kind of, you know, they're recognized that in here, and they have to. Um, drug residue in milk, I was kind of surprised by that one, because um, in a lot of food safety plans for dairy operations, they've removed uh, drug residue in milk because... They've done such a good job of keeping it out of the supply chain. And they're saying that's no longer a risk reasonably likely to occur. So again, here, take the context into consideration with this when you're looking at it. And you know what, uh, Brian, it, you know more about these than me. I'm just going to ask a question, assuming that I'm, uh, I'm receiving milk. Yeah, And I want to say the regulation says, oh, you need to test for this and this and this, whatever that is. I don't know. Now, the question is, are those only the only drugs being used in animals? Because well, if you test for a drug that is not uh, uh, used, of course, you are not going to be finding. But if you test for something different from what is being used, you're not going to find that too. Right. Well... So a couple of comments on that. So organic and non-organic farms are allowed under regulations. So only new, use specific drugs. So if you go outside of those regulations right now, you're adulterated, right? You've produced a product that's not manufactured to standard. And yep. the dairy plants still test, right? You have incoming antibiotic testing. And the rationale was if it fails the test and we reject the milk, it never gets into the plant. 
right? So it, it's like rejecting a, a, a supply a supplier. Yeah. So yeah. that's part of the rationale around that too. So I was very interested that that popped up. So let's let's take a look here, and and again, I'll post this so everybody can take a look at it. Is FDA closer to zero? That was very interesting. So I wanted to get to the tables here because we're getting short on time. Is come on tables. So here's the new table. So this is the new micro table. So you'll notice here, right? There's no Shigella. They have combined parasites and virus into one column, and they are now linking things together relative to these different risks, right? So you have 1A, 2B, right? This kind of subcategories, and they're making comments over here. And recognize, I just want to call this out to make sure it's clear, is they're using these as examples, right? This doesn't mean everything. <laughs> it's like, okay, does my product fall into this category? Am I producing a puff pastry type product? Okay, then number one is probably the correct way to look at this. So, and they also make comments in here too, right? So you'll notice as well, you have like X with a, with a three, right? A superscript three. So at the end of these different sections, they've made notes relative to these different topics. So, all right, if you're producing a custard cream pie cheesecake, you need to maybe be thinking about Bacillus cereus and Clostridium under particular circumstances. And th yeah. they're also saying E. coli, salmonella, and listeria is something that you should be thinking about regardless. Yep. Yep. Oh, the tables are wonderful. I, I really believe that, oh my goodness, these guys did an excellent job. Yeah, they but did I mean, a lot of thinking about this. Outstanding. And I mean, just think about it. And, and to your point, Jose, and I, I'm glad that you said that, right? Because thanks to this group that did this, right? Because this is a lot of, it's hard enough creating a hazard analysis for one product in a facility. Imagine trying to think of all permutations for all different types of products and coming up with a table that makes sense. That's, that's not easy. It's an amazing job. So that's the physical, and you, so phys physical, and they have us broken down by different categories. Let's getting to the chemical table the here. Chemical, so we can take a look at that. What's that? It, the chemical starts after table one P as in Paul. You're in one E right now. Uh huh. Keep on going. Room. Yeah, it's Sorry. huge. Yeah. <laughs> So this document is, yes, there you 90, go. here we go. Okay, yeah, okay, so here are the chemical, right? So you have drug residues, arsenic, cadmium, lead, right? Specifically calling those out. To your point, mycotoxins and natural toxins and pesticides, right? Yeah. So, so even though, right, so raw coffee is kind of an interesting one in that, FDA calls that out specifically and says that raw coffee is is so coffee beans that are unroasted are are kind of in this weird zone, right? They're not a food because nobody nobody sits and snacks on raw raw, raw coffee. <laughs> so, um, oh, Cortland had a question here relative to drug substance uh, testing in dairy products. Um, if you want, my email's on here. Email me offline, and I'll I'll, I'll go into nauseating detail if you'd like. Um, so you'll notice here at the bottom, right? So you have a subscript here for one. So the applicable mycotoxin is okra toxin. And they give references for that in the codex, right? So fantastic, right? They're, they're giving you and pointing to you too a lot of the documentation that you need because part of the good hazard analysis, and I think this is a, a good way to kind of close out our conversation, is you have to have the receipts too, Jose. So when yeah. you go through and identify all these type of things, you have to list the source material that you use to come to those conclusions. Don't forget and, that. And, and, and to the point of the coffee, uh, Brian, if you receive the green bean and there is evidence of okra toxin, cannot be removed. Right. You, you cannot receive that. Even right. if it's a green bean and it's going to be roasting, the roasting process is not going to take out the chemical hazard. Nope. So that's why supplier control for the control of mycotoxins and other type of, of toxins is so important because, yeah, if you have a bad supplier and they're pouring their coffee beans on the ground and they're getting wet and mold is growing, that's how the toxin gets produced. Yep. Supplier control, good suppliers, always comes back to that. Ah, thanks yep. for the link, Duncan. Appreciate that. Cool. Ah, uh, Jose, we're out of time. Wow, we're, we're just scratching... 
scratching the surface here. Um, yeah. Any closing thoughts for people on this? Uh, yeah, same as always, Brian. It's about doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, oh, I'm uh, I'm the new QA in this company, and we have these hazard analysis. Uh, whomever is arriving is inheriting the hazard analysis. So the person should be responsible to check that and make sure that that is okay. Yeah. Yep. Don't rely on the past, right? So, yeah. and, and so my final thought on this is, is the way I always look at these is you have to be able to tell your story. It's not enough just to write these things down. You have to explain why you wrote those things down. And yeah. more importantly, why you chose to admit other things. Right? Because you have to yeah. sit down. FDA is on the other side of the table with you. You have to explain to that person why you did what you did. And the better you understand that, the less your risk of a 483 or worse. Yep. Perfect. So with that, guys, wow, fantastic chat. Um, <laughs> man, we covered a ton. So I promised locals that I would give you guys, and I didn't pull this up ahead of time, so... I will put in here my link to the locals group. And again, the locals group is simply a free service that I do. So every week, two or three times, I go through all the different sources for recalls and information, just like we're talking about here today. And I post this in my group. And in this group, you can get all this information. And... They've changed around their formatting here. I will put that link in here after I get off, but it will be in the chat. I don't want to waste everybody's time. So sign up for that free service. Keeps you in the loop. Keeps you ahead of reasonably foreseeable. So with that, we'll bring our chat to a close for this week. Fantastic chat. Thank you, Jose. Always amazing. This guy's a wealth of knowledge. That's his email. Oop, there we go. That's his email there. Reach out to Jose. He's happy to help. So with that, we'll close out our chat for this week, and we'll be back here next week at the same time with another amazing guest like Jose. We live stream on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Eastern, right here. So join us for the next chat. In the meantime, enjoy your weekend. Have a great one, and we'll see you back here next Friday. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic comments. Have a great weekend. See you later. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Brian.